Hi, everyone. I am very excited to be here at this wonderful conference and opening this uh, terrific session. And I'm going to tell you today about our work looking at the tumor microenvironment using multiplex imaging. So the tumor microenvironment is in oh wait sorry there we go. So the tumor microenvironment is incredibly complex. It is comprised of many different cell types. These include tumor cells, stromal cells, vasculature, and a lot of different immune cells. And moreover, all of these cells need to communicate and interact with each other in order to drive complex phenotypes that we're interested in understanding, such as tumor progression and response to treatment. When we think about normal tissues, we often think about the fact that the structure of these different cell types within the tissue really drives the function of the tissue. And we've seen beautiful examples for this um, also in this conference. But when we imagine tumors, we often think about them as these disorganized balls of cells. And what, what I would like to do today is suggest that also in tumors, we can also find organization uh, of all these different cell types that drives their function. So how do we study the tumor microenvironment? We use multiplexed imaging, uh, where we can actually visualize many different proteins in situ. The specific multiplexed imaging that we utilize in our lab is MIBITOF, which stands for Multiplexed Ion Beam Imaging by Time of Flight. And it was developed by my postdoctoral advisor, Michael Angelo from Stanford, together with Sean Bendel from Stanford. The way MIBITOF works is as follows. We start with a tissue biopsy, just as you would start with any clinical specimen. And we then stain it with a mixture of 40 different antibodies. Once these different antibodies bind their targets in the tissue, we can then visualize them using secondary ionization mass spec. And excuse me, I forgot to mention that each one of these different antibodies is labeled by a different metal tag, very similar to what one does in CYTOF. And so we can now go over the tissue using secondary ionization mass spec and then raster the tissue pixel by pixel, thereby releasing these metals that were bound to the antibodies. And so for each pixel in our image, what we get is a mass spectrum depicting the protein expression in that region from which we can then reconstruct the multiplexed image. So here you can see an example for how this data looks like. This is from a melanoma patient. So here we can see in uh, panel A, we see expression of DNA, lamin A, C, CD4, UD5, and beta catenin. You can appreciate how we really get the single cell features. We can also have subcellular resolution. We see nuclei, we see membrane, we see cytosol. We can see here these large, for example, multinucleated cells. And of course, we get these images, even though I'm showing only three channels in each one, we have 40 different uh, channels, so 40 different proteins that we see expressed in each one of these images. I'm going to talk very briefly about how we use this our, uh, platform to study the tumor microenvironment in triple negative breast cancer, and then continue to more recent work. So a word about triple negative breast cancer, about 10 to 20% of breast cancers are classified as triple negative. This is a negative definition, so these are tumors that do not express ER, PR, or HER2. However, for a very long time, it's been established that in these tumors, prognosis is correlated with the amount of immune cells in the tissue. And therefore, it was also the first breast cancer to be authorized for treatment by immunotherapy. So we wanted to ask which immune populations are found in these different patients, which of these cells express different immune checkpoint molecules, and at the end of the day, try and understand which patients would stand to benefit from therapy. And so to do that, we teamed up with an excellent breast cancer pathologist, Robert West from Stanford, and together with Mark Bosse from the Angelo Lab, we compiled a TMA of 41 different breast cancer patients, and we profiled them profiled them by MIBI using a panel of 40 different markers designed to look at different attributes of the tumor, for example, expression of P53 and EGFR. A large fraction of the panel was dedicated to looking at Im different immune cell types. And we also had four different immune regulation molecules, LAG3, PD-1, PD-L1, and IDO, all of them at the time under investigations for immunotherapy for breast cancer. We put together a computational analysis pipeline to analyze this data in which we start from the 36 dimensional image. We then perform deep learning segmentation in order to identify the cells in the image. And here I'd like to give a huge shout out to our uh, wonderful collaborator, David Van Valen from Caltech, who has put together the deep cell segmentation 
uh, platform. And I'm also going to put in a plugin for a talk in this conference by Noah Greenwald. I uh, believe it was presented yesterday, uh, but you can still catch his poster, poster number two. So recently, Noah, together with the Van Valen Lab, have uh, released a new algorithm for cell segmentation, which is called Mesmer. It's on the deep cell platform, uh, which can do whole cell segmentation. And it got the prestigious honor that uh, after it was published on archive, it was the most popular tweet. So, you know, that's a very impressive. Um, and more impressive than that even is that the algorithm really does a really good job of segmenting uh, tissue images. And I highly recommend listening to Noah's talk and also uh, checking out this platform. So back to breast cancer, after we have cells segmented in the image, we can then cluster the different cells and now overlay them on the image and ask very interesting questions as to how these cells are organized in the tissue, what are the multicellular structures that we identify, how does it look in different patients, and finally, how does it relate to clinical uh, attributes such as patient survival. So we started by asking which immune populations are found in different patients. And so here you can see all of our 41 different patients and tumor cells here are colored in gray and different flavors of immune cells are colored uh, in different colors. And what immediately jumps out is this very large heterogeneity in immune composition across patients. So as you can see here, for example, some of the patients will have, as in patient 26, predominantly macrophage in her tumor, whereas this patient 16 has predominantly T cells. And we wanted to ask what underlies this differences. So what we did is we took all of our patients and we sorted them according to their total immune infiltration. And what we found is that the immune composition was really correlated with the total immune infiltrate. So, so the more immune cells a patient had in her tumor, the larger the fraction of T helper cells and the smaller the fraction of macrophages. And so this led us to think that maybe there's some organization and codependence between immune populations in the tumor. So we took all of our patients and we classified the different immune populations as either present in that patient or absent. And this is depicted here in this table. So every row here is a patient, and if a specific patient had a specific immune population in her tumor, it's colored yellow, and otherwise it's colored blue. And before we did this analysis, we actually didn't really know what to expect, right? So we thought maybe some patients will have NK cells and other T cells and some will have B cells, but it actually turned out to be very organized. So for example, all of the patients that had NK cells in their tumor also had B cells, CD4, T cells, CD8, and macrophages, but not the other way around. So putting this together with the previous result, what this leads us to think is that there is some sort of structured recruitment of immune populations into the tumor. We then wanted to ask how are these different phenotypes distributed in the tissue? So what we did is we developed a spatial enrichment analysis whereby if we have two different phenotypes, let's say a red phenotype and a green phenotype, we randomize their locations in the tissue in order to evaluate the enrichment of red cells to sitting next to green cells in the tissue. And when we performed this analysis, I think the most striking uh, result that we found was that for a very long time, TNBC has been classified into two different spatial organizations, a cold organization and a hot organization. So cold tumors are tumors that have very low immune infiltrate, as you can see here by the low number of orange cells uh, and the tumor cells are colored blue. And hot tumors are those that have a large immune infiltrate, as is depicted here by the large amount of orange cells. What we found that hot tumors could actually be further subclassified into what we called compartmentalized tumors, where you see these very vast, uh, large islands of immune cells spatially separated for tumor cells, and these mixed organizations where really the immune cells and the tumor cells are all mixed together. And it's important to note that this property of being compartmentalized and mixed is orthogonal from the overall infiltration. So tumors with similar number of immune cells can really differ in their spatial organization. So I, we showed these two properties. We have these different immune cells in the patients and we have these different histologies. We wanted to ask, is there a connection between the two? And for the sake of time, I'm just gonna talk about one result in this uh, regard, where we looked at who is expressing PDL1. So the dogma in the literature for a very long time was that tumors express PDL1 in order to suppress the immune response against them. But for the last couple of years, actually antigen presenting cells have been gaining importance and people have started thinking that really it's the interaction between the antigen presenting cells and the T cells that is median, uh, mediating this immune suppression. So these two different models will give us two different expectations of what we want, we'll see in the patient tumors. So in the first one, we'll see tumor cells expressing PDL1, whereas cytotoxic T cells express PD1. 
And in the second one, we'll see immune cells expressing PDL1 and T helper cells expressing PD1. So when we look at who is actually expressing PDL1 in our patient tumors, we very nicely find both of these scenarios, but in different patients. So here, for example, you can see patient 33, where we find that most of the PDL1 is expressed on tumor cells, whereas in this patient no, uh, number five, PDL1 is predominantly expressed on immune cells. Do we ask, does this differ with the histology between compartmentalized and mixed? The answer is very much yes. So compartmentalized tumors tend to have PDL1 expression on immune cells, whereas mixed tumors tend to have PDL1 expression on tumor cells. And not only are these cells co-occurring in these specific histologies, they're also located in very specific regions. So if we now focus around the tumor immune boundary, you can see that over here we find these layers of myeloid derived suppressor cells really shielding between the tumor and the layer of lymphocytes uh, um, um, on the other side. And this repeats itself between patients. And so I think really the exciting thing about all these technologies is that, you know, we can really start bridging together these different length scales and organizations within the tissue, right? So we can look at the histology, whether it's mixed or compartmentalized, relate that to the different cell types that are located in the tissue and how they're organized and go all the way down to the signaling pathways, which are perhaps mediating these interactions. Of course, one important question is, is this prognostic? So uh, yes, the compart we found that the compart patients with compartmentalized tumors um, tend to do much better in terms of survival. And I was actually very excited to see when last week a new paper came out, which applied a very similar approach in head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. Um, and they also found that uh, in that context of the tumor, also compartmentalized patients tend to do much better than mixed. So we would like to now propose that maybe this is a general architecture that you know, could be applied across a variety of different tumors. One of the things that were very interesting to us was to ask how preserved are these architectures in different tumor regions? And of course, you know, this relates to the spatial heterogeneity of the tumor, which a lot of other people are also looking at. And so what we did is we took one of our triple negative breast cancer patients, and in that patient, we profiled eight different regions from the same patient, and we did the same exercise. We um, classified tumor phenotypes, and we classified immune phenotypes, and we asked, do different regions have different phenotypes? So when we do this for the, phenot for the tumor phenotypes, the answer is very much yes. So different regions have very different uh, tumor phenotypes, as you can see over here by these different colors. However, when we look at the immune phenotypes, we found that the immune phenotypes were very much conserved between uh, different tumor regions. If we look at these different organizations, if you know a tumor is mixed or compartmentalized, then all of the eight different regions um, for that patient were pointing towards a compartmentalized architecture in all of the different parameters that we looked at. Um, when we do examine these differences in immune infiltration between the different regions, they were actually very nicely explained by this chronology of recruitment into the tumor. As you can see here, I'm showing you the same plot for before, only now I added these eight different regions uh, depicted here by these orange rectangles. And so what we think that we're seeing here is differential progression of immune recruitment only this time within a single tumor. So putting it all together, when we look at the tumor phenotypes, we find very high regional heterogeneity, which is consistent with what others have reported. However, when we look at the immune system, it looks like the immune system is much more consistent and prognostic. So it's kind of integrating all of this information from the tumor. Um, and when we do observe differences between different regions, they seem to be coming from differential progression of the immune infiltration into the tumor. So what I would like to suggest here is kind of this framework to how we can now start looking at these, you know, single cell data. So I would like to uh, give here an analogy to gene expression. So, you know, a very long time ago, people would measure one gene at a time and kind of focus on that gene and you know, see if in a specific condition it's upregulated or downregulated. Uh, but then we found that actually genes work in modules and that there is a lot of power in looking at genes together. And that you, usually when you see one gene upregulated, you will also expect to see the entire module upregulated. So what I would like to suggest here is that we're now really in the you know, beginning of starting to look at single cells in the same way where we're no longer looking at them as these mixed bag of cells, but rather as these organization of various different cell types and phenotypes working together and co-occurring at the same time. 
And so one of the things that we've been working on very hard recently is to automatically identify these uh, different microenvironments. And this is work led by Zheng Hao Chen together with Ilya Klugo and Vladimir. Uh, and what we do here is we now actually try and find these different microenvironments de novo within our samples. Uh, and to do that, we borrow an approach from topic modeling, uh, where, you know, in topic modeling, people try to connect documents, um, they look at the words in the documents and they try to identify topics within them. So very similarly, we now look at a samples, we see which cell types reside in them and we try and connect them using microenvironments. And the approach is called spatial LDA. I'm not going to go into the details uh, for time, but what it allows us to do is it now allows us to look at combinations of different cell types together and move from looking at different cells to looking at these microenvironments where these microenvironments are now defined by the co-expression of different cell types together. And when we apply this approach on the TNBC data set, we find five different microenvironments, and we see that these microenvironments are highly, highly prognostic of survival, even more than asking if a specific um, tumor is compartmentalized or a mix. And so for the last two minutes of the talk, I want to talk um, about some very recent work that we're looking on, uh, which is how to, this is going to be uh, technical, but we're very excited about this. Uh, and that is looking about how we now can embed these multiplexed images. And this is work from Omer Bartal in my lab. So interacting with multiplexed images is incredibly hard, right? What we usually do is we take our 40 dimensional uh, image and we try and find, you know, six very interesting channels. We plot them together. But the problem is that, you know, six colors in one image from one patient are not necessarily going to be informative in a second patient and vice versa, right? So I can now find another combination of six colors that are really gonna outline very nicely the tumor of patient two, but they're not gonna be very informative for patient one. And of course, you know, choosing six out of 40 has uh, a lot of different possibilities. And it's really very hard when you just get the data to look at these images. So I've shown you to, before the approach that we take, we segment the cells, we overlay them. And to a very large extent, this is the approach that has been taken by everyone in the field, right? So this is uh, from a paper looking at IMC data. This is a paper looking at CE3D data. And this is from a paper looking at codex and all of them basically apply the same approach. However, segmentation has a lot of issues. Um, so here you can see a, uh, a MIBI image before segmentation and after segmentation. Segmentation is often inaccurate. You lose a lot of detail. You don't see non-cellular materials such as the ECM. You don't see subcellular expression. You don't see polarization. And this is, of course, not only in MIBI data. This applies to other multiplexed imaging modalities. And I would like to claim that for this reason, these images were taken from papers. People usually, when they show the segment, Segmentation maps also show, you know, some images um, of the raw channels where you can actually see all of these attributes. So what we've been working on recently is really a neural network based approach in order to embed these um, images and try and look at them all together. Right. So we now take these images and we pass them through an autoencoder into an embedded space, which allows us at a first pass to kind of evaluate the different tumors and try and tease out these microenvironments directly from the images without going through this entire process um, of cell segmentation. And this is very, very preliminary, but we're super excited um, about these results. And with that, I would like to thank all of the people involved in this work. Um, I've mentioned most of them as we went along. Um, and thank you to my group and my funding agencies. And thank you for listening. Thanks, Leah. That was fantastic. So we'll start now a five-minute Q&A. And the first question that I have here comes from Eric Yang, who wanted to know if you saw that chemo prevented or promoted compartmentalization in your data. So do you see any changes in the spatial structure in response to treatment? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. In this uh, cohort, all of the samples were pre-treatment samples, but this is exactly what we're doing now. We're, we're looking at post-treatment samples. Because that would be, of course, very interesting, right? To see how these microenvironments and how these organizations change, you know, after treatment. Very cool. Thanks, Jed. There's another question from uh, Saravana Dana Sekaran. Uh, did you see any specific markers on these macrophages that shield tumor from T cell infiltration that you showed in the TNBC? And in general, if I may also ask, are, are there more 
anti-inflammatory macrophages or pro-inflammatory macrophages? Yeah, so first of all, they were very highly suppressive. So they were um, expressing both PDL1 and IDO. Um, and very interestingly, these were all, not only macrophages. So we saw these macrophages, but they were also a lot of DCs next to them. Very cool. So, Leah, an, another question comes from Judy Kaosau, uh, who asks, can you comment on the resolution and accuracy of maybe talk compared to some of the other imaging techniques? You know, for example, how many antibodies can you look at at the same time on the same cells, um, just to sort of place it among the other technologies that are out there? Yeah, so we can currently do 40 different antibodies. Um, and in terms of resolution, our kind of custom resolution that we work uh, in is 400 nanometers. But in terms of the instrumentation, you can go down to 200 nanometers. Uh, because you acquire the data pixel by pixel, if you, you, know, you want to increase resolution, it's going to take you more time to acquire the images. So it's kind of a trade-off between the resolution that you want to achieve and the time that you're willing to invest in uh, imaging. There's another question here from uh, Yamila Roca. In your data, NK cells are recruited uh, less uh, at the last stages of PNBC. Is that correct? I had the idea that NK cells would primarily have a role in early stages of tumor development. What do you think could be the role for uh, this recruitment? Also, thank you very much. It was a great talk. Uh, so thank you. And, and, and that is a really excellent question because actually when we saw this at the beginning, um, we were also surprised. Um, so we're not completely sure, we're not completely sure why this happens. You know, first of all, we don't really know that this is a late stage, right? This is our interpretation of the data. Um, but it could be that, you know, these cells are being recruited there, uh, only after antigen presentation has, has happened and maybe has gone down. Uh, and this is why these NK cells can now infiltrate the tumor. But this is, you know, this is of course a hypothesis and, and needs to be checked in the lab. Great. So, Leon, uh, Jared Slosberg asks, if you could comment a little bit more on what's happening in your topic modeling. The real question is, are you capturing cell types as your topics, or is there some spatial information that's actually getting captured in the topics as well? And if so, what is that information? What what appears to be the most important in your LDA? Yeah, so that's, that's really uh, a great question. So we're definitely capturing spatial information. I didn't go into um, the details, but what we do is we basically define these small microenvironments, which are centered around, um, you know, our target cell. Uh, they're on the order of 50 to 100 microns. Um, and so we're looking at, you know, what happens in this very small microenvironment. And then we basically do this dimensionality reduction on the microenvironments in these very small scales. So this is not only cell type, and we're definitely catching combinations of cells that tend to co-occur together or not. And we may have different microenvironments, both of them having CD4 T cells, but in different contexts. Awesome. There's another interesting question here from uh, Gunjan Sharma. Uh, are there any factors that define if the tumor will have a mixed phenotype or, or a compartmentalized uh, phenotype? Yeah, that's a super interesting question. Um, we did not have uh, genomics uh, or gene expression data for, for these tumors, but this is definitely the next thing that is now happening. Cool. I mean, I think we have time for one more. Uh, Mark asks, you know, that was, he says, uh, thank you for such a great talk. And he asks if you could elaborate a little bit more on how you think about, you know, coupling together what you're getting with the MIPI talk with other modalities, say, for example, um, you know, spatial transcriptomics. Yes. So um, I, I think I just gave an example, you know, for where. So I think maybe TOF is terrific because you really see, you know, single cell resolution. Um, you see subcellular resolution. But then, of course, you're limited in the number of markers uh, that you can look at. You're also limited to markers. You know, we look at antibodies and proteins. Um, so we can't see, for example, variants um, in expression or mutations. And I think that these are really the places where it would be super fascinating to couple these with these other approaches that give us, you know, a larger breadth of what is happening in terms of gene expression data. And then you could use an approach like MIBITOF for follow-ups, you know, validations and, and, and looking at specific things within the tissue. Awesome. Totally agree. Well, thanks again for a fantastic talk. Thank you.